All righty. So uh, thank you again. I, I really appreciate um, having the opportunity to speak to the group today. Um, and um, I've, I've really enjoyed um, getting involved in some of these projects with, with Tom. Um, I, I have actually been involved. I did research back at university in 1984 on taking organic wastes and turning them into products. And that got me into the composting industry kind of from the very, very early days and had a company that brought these products to market in many forms. And since then, I've worked with biosolids and worm castings and digestate materials, as well as biochar. And the interesting aspect about it is, as, as, but the bio industry, the biochar industry a, a, attempts to grow, there are really interesting pair, uh, uh, parallels. But um, the, the, the project that, that Tom got me involved with um, this past year was um, he basically put it out in front of me and said, um, uh, U.S. Forest Service is involved in this industry. They're looking at ways to help. Um, and we're tasked with providing them input on how best to invest for the growth of the industry. Obviously, uh, charring as um, pyrolysis, as Harry mentioned, is, is, is pretty important. Uh, to the US uh, Forest Service. So I won't go over uh, some of this stuff in big detail because there's not, there's not a lot of time today, but uh, needless to say, um, um, one of the first things we, we did in gathering data was review uh, past data, uh, market, market studies, uh, research, and we, and we surveyed both uh, product manufacturers, uh, product brokers, and um, and end users to get their feedback and see where things, um, you know, diverged or uh, or coincided. So um, here is a kind of an outline of of what we found. But it is important to understand that as you know, we're looking at ways to help um, expand the industry. It's still it is still a young industry. And, um, you know, it took the U.S. Composting, uh, composting industry three gyrations to actually uh, uh, create a market that, that actually worked and a, a market that's, that, that actually persisted. And it's only 40 years old, but there were attempts ahead of time. Um, it is important to understand that there are some uh, innate issues with being a young market, a young industry, I should say, is that we have, you know, we have limited production, although there is production all over the country, we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, there are limited volumes. Uh, the industry as a whole probably is not as con con uh, cohesive as it needs to be. Um, there is education and research being done, uh, but this could be uh, improved. Um, and then there's a series of coordinations that, that, that could occur that would improve the growth. And bottom line is their needs, the industry could be, could really benefit from a catalyst, from a jumpstart. And um, I, I hope in many ways that the, um, the U.S. Forest Service, their interest, their, uh, their financial assistance will, will help um, that jump jumpstart that. So we went up to the industry and started gathering information. Um, how, what, what are, where do we need to focus investment to help grow production uh, and, and markets and end use for biochar? Uh, the, the answers were categorized into three major areas, infrastructure, production, research, resources and standardization and end use and marketing and sales. So, you know, uh, here, here's a compilation of, 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 the, um, of the 10 issues that were brought up over infra, uh, infrastructure production. We can't go through them all because of time, but in each of the cases, in each of the three ca uh, categories, I'll go over two or three of them um, that were a big focus. And uh, one of the big issues is uh, uh, industry supply. And actually four out of 10 of the issues brought up were supply related. Um, we're talking about now um, having a consistent supply. There are facilities that, that start up and shut down because of maintenance, have larger volume capacity in different regions of the country. So supply uh, end users can count on that supply. Um, and even uh, making the material available in different forms. Actually, most, most uh, biochar providers uh, don't sell it in bulk form. Um, as we all know, or we should know, being able to sell the material in bulk 
It does lower its overall value, but for that reason, it, it, it allows for larger scale people to use the product. Uh, they, they do more value add by packaging and, and things like that. So uh, there are several issues. And it, this is a really, really tricky thing too, because we can talk about investment into new facilities and I've been involved in, 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 in situations in the US and in Europe and elsewhere with grant money, uh, expanding programs and things, and that's great. But um, the biochar uh, uh, sourcing uh, production facilities have to grow um, and, and they have to be economically viable. So just jumpstarting the industry by throwing uh, uh, money at it as for, for infrastructure is not always the best way to do it. Um, we have to ask ourselves, where do we fit? Where does it fit? We'll get into that, okay? What else did we find out when it comes to infrastructure and production? Um, business models. We still have to take a closer look at the business models that exist out in the industry. There were three identified in the research that I, I picked up on that were predominant. And that was producing low volumes of production, kind of backyard facilities, uh, materials being thrown, uh, produced through the internet. And then there's production through green energy production. And then interestingly, we have several facilities, larger facilities that are operated by people who have to, to have to manage um, carbon, but, but the marketing and the technology provision was provided by an outside consultant and they're managing uh, distribution. So, you know, one of the questions that's going to have to be asked is where do you spend your time building the industry? Uh, back in the mid 90s, the U.S. Composting Council found out, realized that they had a back off of backyard composting because there were other government interests in that that were being it was being promoted by cities and they focused on larger scale uh, expansion, uh, volume management and the question is going to be: Is that is that model going to hold true for the biochar industry? We'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Um, and of course, the the the, um, the last thing when it comes to infrastructure and production that I want to mention is that uh, th there and this will be discussed later on is that um, there is a a the producers of biochar have a limited uh, knowledge base when it comes to the benefits of the product and the and and how best to market it. Uh, and in fact, the largest producers of biochar are not really producing it uh, in-house, but they have outside brokers doing it for them. And that's okay. That model can work. Um, it's been used elsewhere. Um, but there are, there's upside and downside to that, uh, to that model. But the key here is um, industry at large, it's important for the people who are, who are um, involved in the manufacturer uh, see that my money can be made through marketing of the material so they invest more, whether it's hiring internal staff or investing in, in field research. And I think that the USBI can really help here being a clearinghouse and, and help um, when it comes to uh, even hosting training events when it comes to marketing and other things. The second major area that we looked at or, or that, that, that input came back on was on resources and standardization. And, and Harry mentioned this before, and Lord knows people who have seen me speak at your conferences, the biochar conferences, I harp on this all the time because I lived through the standardization phase of, of, of the composting industry and was involved with it and found the, the great benefits to market development by standardization. And um, we'll get into that right now. But as part of resources and standardization, I do think it's important to mention that uh, uh, USBI has done a great job at organizing the industry, but um, there, there's probably going to be, I shouldn't say probably, there really needs to be a need to have a trade organization um, or an organization that is, that is well-funded um, um, that can both staff up to help the industry um, as well as uh, uh, get, get some resources to complete uh, some key projects. And I'll mention them in a minute. There, minute. There, um, one of the questions that was asked when we survey, surveyed producers and end users is what do you need us to do to get you to use more product? So 
Um, one of the other things that, 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 came, that came down under this answer is, well, um, we have one of, one of the main problems within the industry, we don't always talk about it as much as we need to, is that there's still an argument about what biochar is. Sounds crazy. You can see on the bottom part of my screen is the definition for biochar um, that is being used by most of the state departments, uh, uh, the departments of ag. I'm involved in this industry, AFCO, help, that helps govern the sale of soil amendments and fertilizers. And But the bottom line is there are disagreements within the industry. What is true biochar? Some people, when the first time I, I, I got involved in the industry, they talked about pyrolysis. All right, pyrolysis. Well, the majority of the product is not being produced through pyro pyrolyzers. It's pre being produced from gasifiers. So is our definition going to be inclusionary or are we going to include products from gasifiers? We kind of need to. Um, there's also a couple standards out there that require that the product be minimum of 60% carbon. Is that smart? Is it not smart? Um, does, does, it, does, it, does it lock out certain feedstocks like biosolids and manure uh, from uh, using the, the B word? Um, th these are in important things that really need to, 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 to be settled. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a suggestion about that in a minute. But I think one of the things that we had to do as an industry back in the U.S. Composting Council world again, uh, the, 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 the Digest Day people have tried it, but have an industry summit with some of the leaders and, and debate these issues and, 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 and get them done. You have, to move, you have to move forward as an industry and kind of end the debate um, so it's easy for a, more easier uh, 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 for us to talk about the term and brand um, the term. Um, and one of the other things that Harry mentioned earlier on today is that, you know, uh, there, was a, there was a great, almost every, every producer uh, that was surveyed understood that there was a need for a standardized testing program and, and that, that would lead us to some early numerical standards for the use of the product. Um, uh, we can go into this in more detail later. Um, I've evaluated several of several of the, of, of the draft programs that have bounced around, and and I don't think it would take all that much at all to go to the next level and establish um, a national program as long as we can get the right set of heads in a room together with the goal of getting it of getting it done. And I think it's going to take some type of summit type atmosphere uh, to, to get that done. The one thing that I have found out over the years is that not everybody is going to agree and, and that's going to have to be okay. Um, and here's, a, here's just a, 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 one of the things I was asked to do is look at categorizing uh, different end uses of, of biochar and for the reason of if we were going to create a testing program, what you tested test for will probably be based on the end use and that by, by modifying testing packages based on end use specific to the end use, you can, you can vary the cost of those programs and you don't have to overcharge people for testing. So this is just a first run at categorizing some markets to, for just for a means to an end. And the final area that that was um, was evaluated um, was the the area of end uses and and markets. Um, and it is important to go back and mention, as it was mentioned earlier, that one of our problems with messaging biochar as a product is we don't have a clear cut agreement on what it is. So I won't. I won't, um, I won't uh, harp on that right now. The other thing that I think is in interesting also is talking to end users about what they use biochar for. Right over here, they, will t they have told me, many of them, the majority will say, well, the biochar is not really replacing any specific ingredient. Um, um, it's being used for certain benefits that it has. So that's an intriguing a situation that has to be addressed in market development that we're not always replacing something else. We're helping, we're, we're, we're used as a catalyst. Um, I also need to mention, um, I've, I've done presentations on labeling and registration of biochar products. And it is important to know that sometimes the benefits of biochar are exaggerated. Sometimes 
a whole massive volume of, of biochar benefits are thrown at end users instead of, of really focusing on, on the two, three, four, five that are the most important to them, mean money to them. And here, you know, here, here's, a, here's a nice bag over to the right, which has some nice benefits. Not, nothing crazy. It's smart. It's good. Um, but there's work to be done here to help um, look at, look at uh, a categorizing benefits uh, of biochar and ones that we can show economic benefit. Um, here are some of the, here are some, a, a list of some of the benefits that are going to be more important to certain end user groups and some really good research has been done, but it is going to be key as we move forward um, and we, and we fund university research that we make sure that we standardize testing. So we know uh, the characterization, the characterization of the char that went into the testing so we can better use that test data and understand that it's more effective. Um, uh, finishing up here um, in, in the area of market, of, of market development, um, um, a question was asked or um, it was asked to, to uh, end users being surveys, what would influence you to buy more biochar? And the answer may not be what some of the biochar people wants to, want to hear, but one of the answers was we need a lower price. Um, the market, the actual market needs to be educated. So these, some of these people were buying biochar to mix in their products. So the end users need education and we need a competitive price. And one of the other comments that was mentioned to me was that, well, there are no made markets for big buyers out there just lining up to, to, uh, to buy a product. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a whole cart and horse thing, but that will happen over, over time. Um, and it is important to know, again, that, you know, as of right now, some of these um, biochar brokers, some of them are, are related to technologies, are the most successful uh, marketers out there. So I do think that that US, uh, 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 USBI and US Forest Service can really, really be helpful here in, in, in doing technical and market training. Uh, and we have, to, we have to teach producers and marketers to focus on economic realities for the use of material. Um, and um, I think I mentioned most of these before, uh, these, other, uh, these other end uses or, or the fact that there aren't just uh, end users just lining up for the product, but well, that's reality, you know, and that's something that we have to deal with through, uh, you know, there is a tipping point in these, in these crazy recycled products that we have to throw enough energy at it to create a tipping point, point um, uh, where, where people start talking about and perpetuate what we're teaching them. And that's something we're not at that point yet. And one of the things that will help us get there, I think, is, is a short-term focus on economically viable markets why, while there is also um, uh, emphasis on aspirational or higher tech markets, which are smaller right now and higher value, but will, but will take time. Um, and remember this, that there are a lot of potential uses out there. These are some of the uses that people were talking about th through the, uh, uh, the research. Um, but it is important to know that to help the industry grow, um, um, some of these markets are going to be larger volume and they're going to be more economically viable. We're not, you're not going to make top dollar on some of these markets, but they're going to add stability to production while we're building uh, the supply and demand uh, for specialized products and in high, um, um, high tech uses and other things that bring ingenuity and value to the end uses. So there is a cart and horse thing. Uh, there's coordination of the industry that is so, so desperately needed. I think there are people in the industry that can do this. Um, there's a lot of work to be gained, a lot of work to be done um, to improve um, uh, stability of the industry. And funding is, is a major issue. Uh, the establishment of a trade organization in one fashion or another, um, as well as coordinating uh, re, uh, education and research as well as standardization. So thank you for that. I'm going to go on mute now. And I know at some point in time, there are going to be some questions. So thank you. And I'll also be back on Friday. Thanks.